Good morning. It's good to see everybody this morning. If you're visiting with us, we're glad to have you with us this morning. Always glad to have visitors, and we hope that you feel loved and welcomed here at Mount Pleasant. Make sure that you pick up a bulletin so that you know of all the things that's going to be taking place. We have several things in the bulletin that, that uh, we need to remember and be praying about. It's different things that's going to be taking place. And as you see on the very first of it up here, you see the fires that's placed today in the, in the church is by Paul and Allen in memory of their daughter Jennifer Hughes. So we, we thank them for the flowers. They're beautiful flowers. And uh, also tonight, make sure that, that you get ready for the Wild Beast Feast. We're going to have a good time and, and fellowship and, and, and eating and, and singing and worship. As you know, we were singing the song, we come into the house of the Lord this morning to worship the Lord. That's what we're here for. Amen. Not here for ourselves or for anything else, but to worship a, a mighty awesome God that we serve that allows us to have opportunities to do the things that we're able to do here. So just, just make sure, I've, you know, I've heard there's going to be a, a, maybe a church or two that's not going to have services at at their church tonight's coming here so i think we're going to have a good turnout and, and we invite everybody to come if you say well i don't have anything that to really fix don't worry about it come on we're going to have plenty uh you know somebody wants us to label the stuff for some reason i can't believe anybody think we would cook something that you wouldn't want to eat but <laughs> but they want us to label so if you bring something label it on there so somebody will know what they're what they're trying and you know, last year everybody was scared to death what could be on the counter, and when it was all said and done, everything was eaten, and everybody was grinning and happy. So it'll be that same way tonight. So, so just just come and let's enjoy a good fellowship tonight. Um, do we have any other announcements? Anything outside the booth? And then we got several hands going up. Miss Tedrick, go ahead first. Now, you, you wondering about labeling the food we're going to eat now. You, you hear that? So, so uh, you know, these, these, are, th these are, are things for all of us to get together and enjoy one another and, and, and fellowship with one another. But it's also, you know, raising money for things. Because if you look down on the, on the bulletin, you know, it seems far off June and July. But that's going to be here before we know it. Because we're fixing to be in February already. So... Those things that we're doing is, is for that, Miss Hannah.
right, keep all that in mind there. Again, that's, that's raising, raising money for, the, for camps. You know, because if you've noticed over the last few years as, as we've had youth camps and we've had the RA and the GA camps and all that, when the, when the children and, and the youth and all have come back, it has touched some of them's lives and, and they've made decisions for Christ and all that. So just, just keep all that in mind. Any other announcements? Brother Al, she said she's going to let you go. Yeah, we need to mention that. It's the, the eating's going to start at 5, and then the singing and all will be at 6. So, you know, just be prepared that we'll start eating at 5. So if you're on the social committee or if you just want to come and you want to help out with getting everything set up and ready to go for 5 o'clock, we'll, we'd appreciate it. Any other announcements? All right. If you've come into the house of the Lord to worship, Put a smile on your face and let's worship. Amen. Number 541. We have. Why do I sing about Jesus? Let's stand together as we sing. Yeah. remain standing for our opening prayer. Brother James Whitting, would you lead us? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we have this day. Lord, we open in a song, Lord, that we are gathered here to worship you. And Lord, we just pray that you would accept this worship, Lord, that your spirit would fill our hearts that would come unto us, Lord, that we may lift our voices in praise to you for the love and for the grace that you have granted us this day. Lord, we thank you for your word that you've given us in our Sunday school and the teaching, Lord, that, that you accept the faithful and the willing. Yes. And Lord, we just pray that you'd place in our heart the desire to be of service, to stand up, in a time that this country so much needs you. Amen. We pray for 
our leadership here in our church, Brother Blaine, that you would hedge around him and his family as he tries and is faithful to, to you in service, that you would protect him, prepare him, and Lord, lead him in each and every way. We pray for our country, Lord, that we have a leadership that we feel like, Lord, that we may be coming out from under bondage, that we may raise up and to be a country that would be uh, faithful to you and to look to you for leadership. We just ask, Lord, that you would place in the hearts of the leader the desire to, to lead people in a Christian, in a godly way. Lord, we just, again, thank you for your blessing, your sacrifice, your love that you did on the cross for us, and the resurrection, Lord, that we have a victory over death. And God, we just ask that you would forgive us in our failures, but Lord, that you would strengthen us for your glory. We thank you for this, Lord Jesus, in your name I pray. Amen. 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 We uh, got a couple of songs here that's kind of pertaining to revival. You know, we don't necessarily have to sing them during revival. We can, we we need as a church we need re uh, reviving every every now and then, don't we? Revive us again. Let's sing all four verses of this one. Let's stand together again and sing, There's Power in the Blood. There's Power in the Blood. We know that there's power in the blood of Jesus Christ.
Amen. He did it all for me. He hung on that cross. He did it all for me. I heard this uh, man sang this song the other day. I'm sure y'all have heard it. Brian Haney. I don't know whether any of you ever heard him. I'm sure you have. He sang this song on the television, and I was just sitting there by myself watching him. And it touched my heart. I know that I can't do this song justice if the Lord don't help me. And I just want you to listen to this song. It says, I found the lily in my valley. I think Eddie has probably sung it once, twice, year before. I just want you to listen to the words to it. I found the lily in my valley. <laughs> All alone and broken hearted Trying to calm the raging bell in my mind In search of many answers That my troubled soul just couldn't seem to find I saw a flower blooming where there was no rain or sunshine and i knew not that this flower would change the rest of my life i found the lily in my valley i found strength when i was I found a place to leave my burdens I found refuge from the storm A place where I trained my dark skies To beaming rays of sunshine I found the lily in my valley, and he blooms all the time. So if you're down and broken hearted, and you just can't seem to find peace of mind, You're searching for your answers, but your problems are getting worse all the time. Just reach your hand to Jesus. He'll take you in and break the ties that bind. He'll be your lily in your valley. You can watch him bloom all the time. He'll be your lily in your valley. He'll be strength when you're warm. He'll be the place to leave your burden. He'll give you refuge from the storm. A place where you trade your dark skies to beaming rays of sunshine. He'll be your lily in your valley and he'll bloom all the time. I found the lily in my 
belly. I found strength when I was small. I found a place to leave my burden. He gave me refuge from the storm. Place to where a dark sky. Beaming rays of sunshine. I found the lily in my valley, and he blooms all the time. Yes, he's the lily in my valley, and he blooms all the time. All the time. In your valley. Hope you ain't just hung out all the time on a dry anthill. There is relief. There is salvation. There's more to it than what you see on the TV. If you open your Bibles up to Genesis, I want to talk to you about the justice of God today, just the justice of God. Because, you know, when we look in society, you know, sometimes we wonder, what's going on here? Now, you got people that are doing all sorts of funny marches and putting things on their head and walking around and saying all sorts of ugly stuff. And people saying, well, why are they getting away with it? Well, I'm going to tell you what, Scripture lines all this up for us. Don't be afraid. Don't be worried. Everything's okay. God has a plan. Uh, as you're opening, we're going to look at uh, Genesis chapter 18. We're going to look at verse 25. And as you're turning over there, I want to remind you, I know there has been a big demand for barbecue coon this year. <laughs> Brother Freddie and Miss Diane Cook were so kind to sacrifice from all their coon killing. That's right, they some coon killers over there. And they brought me some coons, and some other people brought me some coons. So there is a whole slaughterhouse of coons that we're going to put up in there. And we, I'm going to have enough for all of y'all to have. Last year I run out, so I'm trying to build up the supply. But it's hard to keep up with the, the demand right here. Uh, we, we, you know, Tedra, she's going to cook a, a, what's that, a deer and wild hog uh, baked spaghetti. Okay, so some of that's milder for you more mellow people and stuff like that. And she's got some uh, sausage, whatever that is, sausage balls, some kind of recipe she made up. And that's wild hog and deer, too. And so we'll have coon meat over there, too. And then we've got something else there. Oh, yeah, got a, got a wild hog leg, got a smoked hog leg, okay? So you can have that, too. So we got all this diversified stuff. Just take a smidgen, all right? If you can take... And, and kind of push back Miss Carolyn and Miss Sandra over there because I know they are fighting. They have been fighting for coon meat. Don't let the facial expressions fool you. I'm telling you, they are some coon-eating people now. <laughs> I'm picking God's going to smite me up here. She's going to beat me up there later and stuff. But, uh, you know, this is all about fishing. I, know, I don't know if you realize this or not, but as we have these things, it gives you an opportunity to... To, to be able to, to go and, well, I know why y'all sweating, okay. Uh, it gives you an opportunity to invite your neighbors. Maybe your neighbors haven't been to church in a while, any church, and you'll know. So we're doing more than just having a, a good time together. I'm not much on just getting together to be getting together. I believe we should fellowship. I believe it's a good thing. But I believe every single opportunity should give us that chance to share the love of Christ with somebody. And I hope you take a chance. Just take, the, take a moment today. And, you know, we have this group. Uh, Brother Raymond has went out, and he's found a singing group that sings three different genres of music. So it'll be Southern Gospel, and it's going to be Bluegrass, and it's going to be Contemporary. So you have pretty much every gamut of kind of style of music that, that's going to be available. So it should reach uh, every single age group. And we can come in, we can praise and worship God uh, gives us a chance to kind of cut up and, and we fellowship together. But as you're here tonight, 
I would ask you that you would go and look for people that you do not know and introduce yourself. One of the hardest things it is when you go to a church that you, you haven't been to before is to make new friends. And of course, around here, most of us are kin. All right? So now think if it ain't your first cousin or your second cousin, maybe down to your third cousin. Uh, a lot of us may not even know some of these people. And when they come in, you're, you're somewhat apprehensive, especially if you haven't been to a church before, uh, of, of how people are going to treat you or what's going to be said or anything else. It's okay to laugh and have a good time in the house of God. It's okay to enjoy just being in the presence of God. God brings that peace and joy to our hearts. So reach out to somebody and bless them in the name of Jesus. Amen? All right, and there's going to be plain chicken and dumplings tonight, some other regular recipes for, for people, okay? So you're not going to... You're not going to go around here and have to say, well, I'll just eat me a bologna sandwich or something like that, okay? And I'll bring bologna if you want that, by the way. But uh, it, it's going to be diff diversified. Don't skip it just because it's wild game. It's not just for guys or stuff like this. This is, uh, this is just that opportunity to fellowship together. If you can stand with me as we read God's holy word. And before I read this, I want to rem remind you this too. Uh, Brother Hiram had a little bit over a gallon of fluid removed from his body. See, that was Friday, right? Uh, and, and I want you to keep him in your prayers as he continues to recover. He, he did real good. It didn't hurt him. Uh, it, it gave him some relief. We're praying the rest of that fluid comes off his legs. Be praying in the name of Jesus. I believe. Do you believe? I believe. All right. Genesis chapter 18, verse 25, it says, Far be it from you to do such a thing and to slay the righteous with the wicked so that the righteous and the wicked are treated alike. Far be it from you, shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly. Let's use that as our opening scriptures today. Father, I thank you so much, Lord, for your presence. Lord, as Brother Raymond was leading us in worship and singing that wonderful song, Father, Lord, we feel your presence. We know that you're here with us. The God of all creation, right here in busy corner with us. I thank you, Father, Lord, for the love that you pour out upon us. I thank you, God, for saving us. And I thank you, God, that you placed that lily in the valley for us. Lord, may you be glorified in all this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I was reading a story with all the things going on, and I was listening to some of these. You know, there's people that's been going to jail and other people that haven't been going to jail. And I got to think about it. This is not the first time things like this have happened. In 1938, they had a man by Richard Whitney. Y'all might recognize that name, maybe a, a bank or something like that. This guy was president of the New York Stock Exchange, and he was found gu guilty of embezzling $225,000. Now, for some people, that ain't nothing. But back then, this is during the Depression era, so, you know, this was a, a lot of money. And he was sentenced to five years in jail. And so, in, in Sing Sing, to be exact. And when they sentenced him, there was this, this big uproar. See, because it said in three and a half years, the man could be paroled from the jail. So, all across this nation, there was, there was this resentment that was taking place because it was such, they fell to such an injustice of his penalty, of, of what he was going through. So you can see it actually uh, in another location because there was a judge that had another man who come before him who had been arrested for stealing $2 from a little bitty gas station. And when the man had stole the, this $2 and he's up for uh, going to jail and stuff, the judge had looked at it and he actually brought up Richard Whitney. And what he said was, he said, Richard Whitney, he got five years for stealing $225,000. He says, so that figures out $45,000 a year, which is $120 a day, and that's $5 an hour. He says, you stole $2. He says, so when I figure this up, it comes to 24 minutes in jail. I sentence you to 24 minutes in jail. Pow, hits that thing. He says, that's your sentence. See, in, in this story, justice is a key word. What people are looking at today is they're wondering sometimes, kind of like King David in different scriptures, and they wonder, why are the wicked prospering? What's taking place here? Well, one thing we have to look about in Scripture is what's the basic meaning of just in the first place? So when you look at that word just, it means to, to be straight or be right. So those who've lived their lives straight in line with the moral law of God, they're just, or what we call righteous, meaning right with God's way. And the foundation upon which the whole world's created, everything that you see, everything was done uh, with, that, with, with God, this just God who is over and controlling all of it. 
So after God reveals himself to Abraham and his intention, he says, I'm going to destroy Sodom. I'm going to destroy this heathen city. And most of us heard that in our Sunday school classes, and, and we understand that. And, and as we look at this, he said that this, this patriarch, he prayed that God would spare the city for the sake of the righteous that was in it. If you look in, in Genesis, uh, same Genesis, chapter 18, verses 23, let's read 23 through 25 right there. It says, And Abraham came near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? And watch this in verse 24. Suppose there are 50 righteous within this city. Will you indeed sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous who are in it? When you look at verse 25. Far be it from you to do such a thing, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous and the wicked are treated alike. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? And that's one of the things that people feel in their heart. They may not speak it out, but they feel that in their heart. See, our main concern, it, it goes along with Abraham's question right here to God. Will not the God, or the, the judge of all the earth, do right? I want you to take that question, I want you to put it in your heart for a second. See, Abraham's based upon his faith that God is just. He, he knew that God was just, and his question was a fair question, and, and God was willing to accept and welcome those kind of questions. And just like he welcomes ours today, he looks at us, and I don't know if you've ever asked God a question. I have. I'm going to tell you right now, I have. And, and God has taught me so much as, as I've read scriptures and I've studied it, and he's brought me from where I used to be to a different location. See, God's just, and that's where you have to begin at in your life. That's where you have to start at is understanding that God is just. But what he does that means the things he does in our lives show it as a fact. The things that we see show. See, so when we look at the scripture, the, the justice of, uh, of God, there's, things, there's four things that we learn right here. I'm going to get all tongue-tied this morning. There's four things that you can learn as you study the scripture. Now, the first is, is that the justice of God, it, it ensures us that prayer makes sense. The people out there, they, they make fun of us, and, and, and they say, well, why do you pray in the first place? Matter of fact, more people know about Muslim prayers than they do Christian prayers. Now, why is it? Because Muslims go and they pray five times a day, facing the east, facing to some big old black rock over there in Saudi Arabia, Mecca. But us, a lot of times we hide our prayers, and we're even scared to pray, because we're not sure about God. Abraham's prayer was based on faith in the righteousness of God. And it's our assurance also because God is right, because God is just. I believe that we can go before the throne boldly and know that he's going to answer it. It's an appeal to God's justice. It isn't, it's not an appeal to his mercy right there. See, true, true believers facing problems that are so difficult they can't handle it themselves, they can take them to God in prayer and they can expect that God's going to do what's right. It's whether our willingness to accept that what he's doing is right. The justice of God, when you look at this, what it, it, it assures us that our, the, the, our world rests on a solid moral foundation. It doesn't matter that the whole society has gone crazy. It doesn't matter all the profanity and the ugliness people spew. God is going to change things and he's going to do things right. God supports what's right and he opposes, he opposes those things that are wrong. You think that people are just getting away with all this stuff with abortion and, and just because you, they, they make laws does not make it right with God. And one day there's going to be a, a balancing of the scales. The universe is not in moral chaos where anything goes and, and everything's accepted. It doesn't matter what they say. It doesn't matter what they believe. What you have to know is what you believe. What do you believe? Who do you trust? See, the God who governs the world, he weighs and he judges the motives that lie within the actions of humankind. Why do you do what you do? Why do you say what you say? What's behind it in the first place? Even as Christians, it tells us that we should do all things in love. See, God's impartial. He's not swayed just because somebody's wealthy. He's not swayed because somebody has prestige or a position of politics or because they're on the TV set. You know, it amazes me how people get out there and they, they fawn over somebody just because they sold an album and they want to listen to them politically. I mean, just because Madonna uh, or, or one of these other people uh, has held or uh, made a movie or anything else does not make them to be the smartest person that ever walked the world. You see, they're just a human being, 
And, and they have these, these songs or these things that people crave. And it's usually, a lot of times it deals with immorality or something. And it reaches out to people and it speaks to the worst part of them. But that doesn't make them smart just because you're rich. Look, the justice of God, what it does is it comes in and it assures the people of God that the final judgment is going to be good and right. They can say what they want. They can vote what they want. We have the victory in the name of Jesus Christ. In the end, right is going to prevail. It says so when you read the book. It says so when you apply it to your heart. That gives you the peace. When you look at all this crazy world right now and you see everybody going and striking, and, and I'm just wondering, like, why don't they have a job? What do they do for a living? And who made all them pre-printed signs for that day that quick? Because we need their printer because they get real quick on the job. Y'all listening to me? Look, sometimes there seems to be this confusion between good and evil in the world. You know, with Planned Parenthood, you know, they do good things. They help people with, with all these different actions, and they, they check for these things for health issues and stuff. Let me tell you something. Planned Parenthood does abortions. Here's what I'm going to tell you. Just because you mix some other good stuff in it, don't make it right. Abortion is not God's way. I got anybody. And so, see, it's easy preaching up in the middle of a Baptist church in a huge metropolitan area, a busy corner. But think about them preachers up north that's out there. Think of these people in the big cities. Think of them, they're marching all down there in New Orleans, and they have to stand up and preach in the midst of all that. You know how they do it? Because they know God's going to weigh it all out, and no matter what, that they got the victory in the name of Jesus. Sometimes we don't understand God's ways, and, and, and we grow impatient with him and say, Lord, won't you do like, uh, it says one of the preachers, I'd read one of the Spurgeon had said, he says, if I was God, I would go and I would just kick this old world away. You ever feel like that? Why don't you, God, just take it and swat it like a mosquito? Let me tell you something, God's got a plan. And a lot of times we grow so impatient, that's that's what's so amazing, is God is so patient with us. Look at our lives, look at our homes, look at our families. See, you, you, can, you can rest assured that God's going to do what's right, and he doesn't make mistakes. He never does, never has, and never will. See, the justice of God, when you look at that word, it, it implies that his judgment on the wicked and the sinful and the rebellious is going to be just. You say, well, what do you mean? Listen. He's going to hold them accountable for these things. Every sin carries within itself seeds of a sinner's destruction and its own judgment. You think people walking around and had women and had their little bitty girls holding up signs with profanity on it, and I'm like, wow. Wow, did you go home and like stick all that glitter on there with flowers with all that putrid language? You don't think the God of, of holiness and righteousness will not hold these parents accountable? The justice of God it, it has a vindication upon the innocent and those who have been oppressed by the evils of this world. Let me tell you, multi-millions of babies have cried out over abortion. Just because they, they legalize it, don't make it right. Look, if God doesn't oppose the evil that destroys us, he can't be for us. Do you understand? There ain't no mixture of it. When you look up the Greek word to find justice, it's giving every person, it says, their due. And you see it in the courts today. Have you ever been to the courts? And we have those weighing scales uh, of what's just, and, and that's what it represents. It's symbolized all across our nation in the courthouses of justice. It says in Amos chapter 5, verse 24, Amos comes up and he starts describing justice. He says, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. See, Amos is saying God does what's right, and he's active in doing it. See, justice exists in relation to a person's justice that's done by a person. So when you get this and you start understanding, it said injustice is, is not breaking the law. 
I want you to listen to me. Injustice is when it hurts a person, uh, someone that God cares for. Who are you? Are you a child of God? Let me tell you something. They better not mess with you because your God is going to hold people accountable. Let me tell you something. These innocent babies, these innocent babies, do you think all these doctors who've done this, and I was listening to an interview of a doctor, and he started describing why he quit doing it. And he started giving uh, the descriptions of it. They have, they have some videos. I know some of y'all uh, like YouTubes and all this. And one of them's called Silent Screams. There's another one that even goes further. But in this, they show an abortion. People say it doesn't affect that child. Listen to me. This ain't popular. I know this ain't going to be popular. I know it's gonna hold, not going to hold some of your attention and everything else. One of the things they say now is just a blob of flesh is separate from a woman. Let me tell you something. It is a human being in that woman. And let me tell you something else. They show where the child flees from this salt solution that they were applying into this womb. Let me tell you something. We've got to have us... We have to love on people who've been through these things. We have to care for these people. But I'm going to tell you something. God's going to hold these doctors and nurses accountable. Listen to me. There's going to be justice. And I'm going to tell you what the injustice is of this life. It's going to come when it's the end of life. We're going to stand before a righteous and a holy God. And we're going to be held accountable for every act and deed that's ever been done. All of this, when we understand, all of the counts are going to be balanced. All these discrepancies, they're going to be made right. All of it, this powerful, all of this should be this powerful reason for us to believe in life after death because I know God is going to take everything out. It doesn't matter what's said. It doesn't matter what they do today. You know, there's been multi, you know, the Christians, the few Christians that are allowed to live in Arabic nations. You hear all this stuff right now that's going on in politics. I'm not trying to get in politics. But haven't you heard less than 1% of the Christians living in Arabic nations, less than 1% were ever allowed to escape when they were slaughtering them over there. God's going to hold them accountable. God's going to hold this all accountable. It can never be right if you look and understand like Elijah and Jezebel and Herod and, and John the Baptist and Paul and, and the Emperor Nero that they would all end with the same. It won't. God is just, and there's going to be held accountability. You can put that in your pipe and smoke it, is the way my daddy said that. That's not, that's not nice, is it? But the justice of God, when you start understanding and you start knowing that God's going to make things right, in the justice of God, there's a cross in the heart of God. And this is one of the hardest things for people to understand that Jesus died for our sins. We say it sometimes, and, and it ought to make a, a twinge in your heart take place. That he died for my sins on Calvary. It wasn't just an easy death. It wasn't a quick death. It, it was a crucifixion. He was nailed to a cross. He was beaten. He was, he was made fun of everything uh, uh, that's evil, that's cruel, that's outlawed <coughs> was done to him. And it wasn't done to him because of, of what he had done or hadn't done in his life. It was done to him because of our sins. It was done to him because of what I did in my life. And when you understand from the very foundation of the world, a cross was raised in the heart of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 and 19, this is what it says. He says, now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. See, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he reap also. Now, that's not that thing people put on them now. And them little, there's a little circle with a, with a thing. What's that thing called? Uh, there's a black part and a white part. What's that called? Yin and yang. It ain't no yin and that ain't no yang. Don't get it confused. This has to do with understanding right and wrong. So when we look at this, then, then how could any of us 
that's sinful in our nature. That you, you may not, you know, you, you come up here and we're, we're dressed nice suits and ties or whatever. You, you know, you're, you're in the church house. And maybe nobody else knows what's going on or has happened in your life, but God knows you. So then how could any of us with that sinful nature, that, that corruptness, hope to, to cross that gulf that separates us from God? How could us ever expect it? See, then how, what's taking place right here? How could we ever hope for, uh, to, to have things balanced out? How, how can justice be satisfied? So his mercy can be possible. Because what we need is mercy. There's only one way. It has to be a substitution. Someone to die in your place for your sins, for your wrongs, for your evils. In Romans chapter 3, verses 25 through 26, it says, Whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation... In his blood through faith, this was to demonstrate his righteousness because in for, the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time so that he who would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So how can a, a, a sinner... An old sinner like me be declared righteous. Be said, he's not guilty. Be declared justified. Let me tell you something. There's only one way. The New Testament says, by faith in Jesus Christ. Faith is the condition of God's free gift to us. In Romans chapter 3, verses 22 through 24, this is what it said. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Christ for all those who believe for there is no distinction now, won't you look for those who believe for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God when we look at these scriptures verse 24 being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus now, let me tell you what this is something that should strike our hearts it's only by that faith in Jesus Christ can we have that salvation, can we can have that redemption, that we can be justified. Let me tell you, this whole world's an evil world. But when you understand, since God is righteous, he expects his children to be righteous. Just because all the things around us, surrounding us, lure us and everything else, he said he's given us that strength to be more than overcomers. See, because God's all-knowing and he's all just, we should strive to be just and righteous. To, to, to be the, the, the reflection of Christ in our lives. Let me tell you something. Justice is a strange thing. My daddy told me a story one time, if you don't think it's peculiar, and, and I, I do. Um, you know, years ago in, in, in Louisiana, there, one of the ways that you had money back there in the early years was you had money by having hogs. If you didn't have hogs, you didn't have money. And my dad had went to a courthouse as part of their, their school um, to, to see how the courts run in the state and across the nation and everything. And it was a black man who was brought up there, and he had stole a hog. And he had stole a hog and, uh, from somebody, which makes it wrong, right? He was sentenced to 20 years of hard labor in Angola prison. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard of such thing, but Angola at that time was the bloodiest prison ever. And sometimes I wonder if he survived it. But let me tell you something. You don't want man judging you. You want Christ. You want to understand that the blood of Christ has covered your sins, has covered your wrongs, that he makes a difference, and that God is just. See, the justice of God, what it does is it warns us to not to doubt God's character. And that's one of the things that kind of overtakes us sometimes. Sometimes we doubt if God's right or doubt God's fair. Sometimes our observations, what they do is they cause us to question things. They, they, whether... Uh, no, God welcomes those honest questions. He welcomes those things, but don't doubt that God's going to do what's right. Don't doubt that God's going to do what's just. In Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 1, this is what it says. It says, Righteous are you, O Lord, that I would plead my case with you. Indeed, I would discuss matters of justice with you. Why has the way of the wicked prospered, and why are those who deal in treachery at ease? Now, Y'all understand that, don't you? 
Look at this. Jeremiah's saying, you're just, but I want to ask you a question, God. Why does the wicked, why they prosper? Why does it look like everything's okay? Why, why do the, the treacherous, those doing these things, why, why does it look like everything's good in their lives? You ever ask that? Of course you have. We, we've all wondered this. We've all put this in the heart. But here's the thing. Don't doubt God. He's going to hold them accountable. See, we're not to pit the, the love and the justice against each other. When, when you understand, with God, they're one and the same. That love and the justice, justice is that love expressed towards people in that human relationship. And sometimes we, we view love as this soft and a naive kind of sentiment. And justice is viewed as being hard-nosed and, and demand for punishment. And, and a lot of times we, we reflect that if we're not careful. But it contradicts the New Testament. Jesus, he was never more just than when he forgave that adulterous woman that had been caught in the act. And he was never more loving than when he drove the money changers out of the temple. We just got to understand love and justice are one. It's the way the scripture tells us. We're, we're not to ask for, for justice, but when we understand that we're to ask for mercy. There's a man, he told Billy Graham, he says, when I get to heaven, all I'm going to do is ask for justice. And Billy Graham says, he says, friend, if you get justice, you're going to end up in hell. You won't need justice. He says, what you need is mercy. And so do we all. Have mercy on us, O God of all creation. God is a God of justice, but he's also a God of mercy and grace. Look at us. What has he done in your life? Let me tell you something. If you're a born-again believer, you're truly a reflection of grace and mercy. As you bow your heads and as they're coming forward to play the altar call song, you will not be good enough to get into heaven, y'all. And just because somebody's as sweet as sugar, that ain't going to get them into heaven. It's for the blood of the Lamb of Jesus Christ. There is no other way. It says it over and over in Scripture. You won't dress enough. You won't have position enough. It doesn't matter what you've done for the church. It matters what Christ has done for you. And whether you've made that decision for Jesus Christ. If you've never given your heart to Christ, I plead with you. Make a decision for him today. It'll change your whole future. If you've been somewhat distraught over what's going on, let me tell you something. It's all going to come out in the balanced scales of God one day. Do not be dismayed. They was absolutely overwhelmed when Trump got elected. Why? Why? Because they went on what they thought they understood. They don't understand anything when the hand of God is moving. Today, is God speaking to your heart? What are you at with your relationship with Christ? If you haven't been serving him, I want to challenge you. It's time to get busy. For the day grows near when the trumpet shall sound. And we shall be called home. Won't you come this morning?
thank you so much for being here today. I want to invite you back tonight. Bring some friends and relatives. There's going to be plenty of food, and there's going to be food that everybody can eat and stuff like that. And if you don't like some of it, you might want to bring some ham. That's okay. Hallelujah. But uh, come back. Bring somebody as we worship and praise the Lord. As we get, we, Brother Raymond's taking so much time to, to find this, these people to come and sing tonight. We're going to encourage them, and we're going to reach out and touch somebody in the name of Jesus. There is a, a children's uh, meeting, right, Hannah? There's a, there's a children's meeting tonight. So where are we meeting at? Right now, right now. Right across from the, the office over there, okay? So uh, if you can attend that, we'd love to have it. Let's pray in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you so much, God, for your presence and your love. I thank you, God, for every man, woman, and child. Bless them, Lord. Father, I thank you, that God, that you've changed us, that you paid the price for our sins on Calvary. Oh, Lord, as we go home, God, I pray that you bring into remembrance names and people, maybe that we know in our community or surrounding. Maybe they don't have a church to attend. Maybe they haven't been active. Maybe they're wounded on the sidelines. Maybe they're just lonely. Oh, Lord, we ask, God, bring them to our remembrance so that we can invite them to come and praise and worship you. To be, Lord, may you be glorified in all our actions in Jesus' name. Amen.